Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook live broadcast. I'm Steve Altitian, Director of Client Partnerships here at Pacific Cascade Family Law. And we're here today with attorney Sabrina Owen to talk about creating a parenting plan that is designed for long-term success. So how are you doing today, Sabrina? I'm great, Steve. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Before we start in, I'm hoping maybe we can talk just for a minute. You can give us a brief explanation on really just what a parenting plan is. A parenting plan is really a, a rule book for two parents who are no longer in the same household that determines when each parent is responsible for the care and control of the children. Um, a lot of times called like a visitation plan, we've progressed in our um, vernacular and started calling them parenting plans because much like, you know, dads don't babysit, they parent, um, they don't get visitation, they have parenting time. Right. Does every divorce with kids have a parenting plan? Um, if you have children, you should. Um, I do see um, some, especially cases that um, the parties have done themselves um, that uh, clearly are not working anymore and coming in for a modification that don't have very specific or detailed parenting plans. And then you essentially don't have one. Um, I, I do see the judge assigning them, but that creates long-term litigation and problems in the future. If you do, It's better just to handle it from the beginning. Yep, and that, that leads right into what we're gonna talk about today. So I wanna start with a basic concept that, you know, I think rules pretty much everything courts require regarding children, and that's the need to act in the child's best interest. Can you give us some ideas on how to keep that as a first priority? I think as long as parents are focused on their children and the needs of their children and understanding that it is important for children to have contact with both of their parents, unless of course there is some sort of detrimental behavior by one parent, um, that it is in their children's best interest to have consistent contact with, with both parents. Um, lots of studies have shown that both parents being involved, whether they're married or in the same household, help with development, help with education, um, and just help people be well-rounded individuals. Um, so a lot of times people need to put their differences with their former spouse um, or former partner aside and focus on what's best for their kid. I say a lot. Um, it's not about winning know. or losing? It's not about winning or losing. And sometimes like you need to love your child and understand the needs of your child more than you hate your ex. Yep, I get that. Do you generally find that they're, they're better if they're more complete or even complicated? Should there be flexibility in them? What, how do they work? Yeah. <laughs> yes and yes. Um, there should definitely be flexibility in it, especially considering the age of the children. Because um, a parenting plan that works for a six-year-old doesn't work for a 16-year-old. Um, and that is one of the things that you need to do in order to keep the best interest of your children in the forefront too. Um, you know, when they have activities that they need to go to and it's on somebody's parenting time, like you need to consider all of these things. Um, I find that the most helpful parenting plans are the ones that are the most detailed, that have a clause in them that say, if the parties agree, they can modify it, you know, if they agree in writing, they can modify it one time or they can modify it um, permanently if they do a notarized writing. Um, but the, the more detail you have in your parenting plan, the less confusion there is down the road when there inevitably is a disagreement, because it's going to happen. That, that makes total sense. Um, so are you, are you including things not just as like hours or days, but I mean, you think things like, you know, if, if food clothing, shelter, mobility, the kind of things, or maybe even, you know, special needs, emotional needs, do they, do they figure into a parenting plan at all? 
They can. It depends on the needs of the child. I think when you're creating a parenting plan with the parents as an attorney, you need to take into consideration the needs of that particular child or that particular group of children. Um, if there are children that have educational needs and need tutoring, you need to make sure that you have in your parenting plan that whoever has the children for that time needs to take the children to their tutoring or their therapy. Um, I put in extracurriculars down to, um, you know, who gets to pick the extracurriculars, how many extracurriculars can be um, scheduled on the other parent's time, and when a parent is obligated to take the child to practice. Um, so, you know, if, if parents can't agree on extracurricular activities, then it's usually, you know, the custodial parent gets to pick one activity where the child's schedule is made by a third party, whether that be football or play practice or band. And that, you know, the other parent needs to take that child to those practices with the rare, you know, and then understand that there are circumstances where a child can't go and that should be the rare exception. Um, because it, it takes care of arguments. Now, if parents can agree and a child is very involved in doing gymnastics and dance and play practice and, you know, all these things and, and the parents can agree on it and they're both willing to take the child to all of these activities on their time, great, do that. Please do that for your children. Um, but in the event that you can't, these are the minimum rules you are going to live by. And, and it sounds like you're saying, you know, certainty can be a good thing and confusion is generally always a bad thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, needs can change and, and you can always try to modify, but, you know, it is my goal that parents get along and, you know, want to do what their child needs done and be flexible in their parenting time, depending on the current circumstances, but in the event that you can't get along and you can't agree, you have a, a decent plan where if one parent just is digging their heels and they say, no, we're going to follow this plan. Yeah. And, and if it's not working for the child somehow, then you need a modification. But at the end of the day, the plan you have is still a decent plan while you go through that modification process. Yep. What about the big decisions? Um, you know, the sort of, medical care, uh, where are you going to live, religious care, those kind of things. You know, it seems like sometimes both co-parents make them, sometimes together, sometimes not. I mean, where should, where should divorcing couples start to think how they start working on how to figure that out? So that actually leads to custody. Um, there are two different things. So you have your parenting time and you have your custody and custody determines who gets to make those decisions. And in Oregon, one or the other has custody of the child and can make those decisions unless the parties agree to have joint custody. Um, there are ways that you can sort of futz with that and give um, custody to one person, but require that they give advance consultation on major decisions to the other party and give due deference to their opinion. Um, but in the event that a couple can't, sorry, there's a helicopter outside my house right now. <laughs> um, in the event that uh, they can't agree on a major decision, one parent has to have the type. Yeah, that, I mean, someone has to, at the end of the day, make a decision for the kids. I, I get that. Um, so over time, can this change? I mean, is, is there also a factor about the, let's say, I'm, I'm thinking on education. Um, if someone, one parent has the, the, the parent with custody, has the right to really make some major decisions about the child's education, but how far does that go? Um, is, is taking 
an event or a sport or extracurricular activity or extra classes, are those generally considered custody issues or parenting time issues? That depends. Um, do those decisions impact the other parent's parenting time? Um, so just because you have custody and you get to make those decisions doesn't mean that you get to just unilaterally schedule your child for tutoring or for therapy only on the other parent's time. So they're responsible for taking them there and they're responsible for, you know, and, and they lose out on their parenting time because of this decision, um, which is why a parenting plan that addresses that is so important because you limit the ability of the parent who has custody and final decision-making to fit within specific parameters that allow less abuse of that power. Yeah. What about emergencies? Is, is there anything in parenting plans about that? Yes. Um, we have communication requirements for emergencies, I usually have in, in my parenting plans a clause, you know, they will communicate via text message. So that constitutes in writing. So everybody's clear um, or sometimes through an app. Uh, I'm particularly fond of our family wizard, um, except in the case of an emergency when phone calls may be necessary. And that a parent in the case of an emergency must make reasonable efforts to contact the other parent as soon as the emergent situation is taken care of. I mean, clearly I don't wanna create a situation where, you know, mom's gonna be in violation of a parenting plan if she doesn't call dad until they actually get to the hospital because a child was bleeding out on the street. Like, you know, you, you have to get the emergent situation handled but then the immediate thing you need to do after that is contact the other parent. Um, I've had parenting plans where we've actually gotten down to, you know, end of life decisions and saying that a child may not be removed from life support until the other parent is there and present. So all of these things you talked about, actually, you, you recommend you put into the plan itself, sort of a prepare early for this. Absolutely. Uh, I think the more particular your parenting plan is, the better off you are because it leads to less confusion in the future. When you have a, you know, every other weekend and one night a week. Okay, is that overnight? Does that start after school? Does that start at six o'clock? Does that, well, we've always just done it from, you know, six o'clock on Friday to six o'clock on Sunday. That's great. That's what you've always done. But what happens when the custodial parent doesn't want to give the child over at six o'clock or, you know, the non-custodial parent chooses to take them to school on Monday instead of returning them on Sunday night. Like you just, the more you have in there, the less opportunity there is for confusion and for one parent to feel like they're being taken advantage of by the other parent. I imagine that's a that that is a large issue that kind of rears its head in the whole concept of, of parenting time and you know creating parenting time that, that works. Um, Especially when you've had a very tumultuous relationship between the parents beforehand. Um, there are, you know, a lot of relationships that have some variety of abuse in them, physical abuse or mental abuse. And part of breaking out of that cycle is not wanting that other person to have control over your decisions, have control over the time. And so a lot of times I find in those situations, the conversation is more about what the other parent is doing and what they get to do and what they get to, you know, and less of it. They don't get to tell me what to do. They don't, I, I don't care if this is okay for their child. They've made this decision and I don't want to do it for them. So when you take them out of it, when you take they out of it and it's the piece of paper, it's much, much easier to just lean back and say, 
I respect your opinion. I understand that. This is what the paper says. So this is what we're going to do. Uh, totally makes sense. If there's, if, if it's not, you know, written down beforehand, it just, you're asking for trouble. Yeah. So that, that kind of leads into anticipating ahead, I guess. And so, you know, one of the things I, I hear a lot about is, well, this worked great when the kids were in kindergarten. Now they're in, you know, eighth grade. Um, can parenting plans be proactive and, and actually sort of anticipate some of this stuff? Absolutely. Uh, and actually a lot of the standard parenting plans or model parenting plans throughout different counties in Oregon uh, do anticipate that. They have parenting plans for like zero to two and two to six and six and over. You have less changing and less need adapting when your children are older. If you have started your process in your parenting plan when your children are in full day school, it, that plan's probably gonna take you through them graduating from high school because it's a routine that they know. But especially with very small children, they change very quickly and you can build those in. Um, a lot of studies and a lot of um, parenting coordinators and child development people will tell you that more frequent contact is more important when children are young. So that's when you will see more of a two, two, three sort of schedule. Two days with mom, two days with dad, weekend with mom. Then two days with dad, two days with mom, weekend with dad. Because you have more frequent contact during those very important bond creating times. But when a child goes to school, especially full day school, um, first grade, you know, sometimes we'll do it around kindergarten, but a lot of times we wait until first grade. Um, those two, two, threes are very disruptive. That's a very, it's a lot of back and forth. It's a lot of exchanges. So that's about the time if you're having an equal parenting time situation where you would want to transition from a two, two, three to a week on, week off. Um, you don't have to agree, wait to agree. So, you know, wait for it to happen and then try to agree and you may not be in an agreeable mood at that point. Ex exactly. And so then your child is stuck in this, well, we have to do the two, two, three. It's not working. It's very disruptive to school. And then you've got to go through another bout of litigation in order to get things hammered out. And if you're at that point and you're not agreeing, you're probably gonna end up getting a parenting coordinator involved. There's definitely going to be a therapist. I mean, you're just, you're in for a lot of attorney's fees if you don't think of these things beforehand. So do you have some tips for some kind of maybe instances that don't always occur? Um, let's say, what if there's a, a, a fair amount of distance between the parents' homes? Um, is there anything they can do about that or ways to adjust? There is. So Oregon has rules about how far you can move and notification requirements. Um, but if, if one of you, even from the beginning, lives a further distance away, a standard parenting plan where you do, you know, a week on week off or an every other weekend and one evening and um, during the week isn't gonna work. The child needs to go to school. They have extracurricular activities. They have friends they wanna be around. So to adjust for that, what's typically done is the longer stretches of time, um, the non-custodial parent will get all of the long weekends from school. There's usually one a month, Martin Luther King Jr. birthday, there's Labor Day, there's, all, you know, teacher work days. So the non-custodial parent or the parent that lives further away gets those long weekends. They get a majority of the summer. Um, and a lot of times, you know, all of spring break, but you're still switching off Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, and all these you can put in the plan right off the bat. So you don't have All of that you can put in the plan right off the bat. I like that. Especially if that move's anticipated. Yeah. Um, 
If it's not, then you're going to need to do a modification. Uh, hopefully, you've got enough notice that you can get a parenting plan in place that is modified and does the long distance before you leave, um, before you relocate. And Oregon's um, standard parenting plans also have recommendations per county um, of close distance and long distance parenting plans. Yeah. You gave some examples of some different, you know, sort of time schedules that the kids are with. Um, does Oregon require a percentage? I mean, I mean is 50-50 is split something that's required? Is it something that's just sort of a goal? Um, because it sounds like kind of the things you were talking about end up sort of being in that 50-50 split thing, but does that happen all the time? It does not happen all the time. And there's a lot of situated reasons that it doesn't happen all of the time. Sometimes it's work schedule. It just can't be accommodated. Sometimes there are issues with one parent or the other. Um, sometimes it's just what the parties decide. I mean, sort of standard visitation since... I don't know, the 80s, um, has been every other weekend. So like Friday at six o'clock to Sunday at six o'clock, and then a dinner on your off week. That doesn't give the non-custodial parent a whole lot of time. Yeah. Um, it also doesn't give the non-custodial parent a whole lot of responsibility. And that has become a major point of contention for a lot of divorcing parents because somebody gets to be Disneyland dad and somebody always has to be the rule enforcer. Um, you see that you know. all the time. So somebody's got a, you know, custodial parent and I'm old enough that I default to mom on that um, a lot of times. And that's not necessarily right ever. Um, and especially these days. But so the custodial parent is the one that has to do all of the homework and all of the grounding and all that, you know, all the not fun stuff. So when you switch from a every other weekend and one weekend, one weeknight on your off week to something a little more balanced, like a Thursday, your weekends start on Thursday and they end it return to school on Monday. It does a couple of things. Non-custodial get parent gets two extra overnight, so we've got extra time. And then they'll have to make sure they're responsible for the homework on Friday and on Sunday. And um, so those, it, those are the things I think people don't think about um, planning for homework, yeah. working with the kids, you know, fulfilling their needs. Because isn't it both parents' responsibility, no matter who gets custody, to raise their kid? Yes. Yes. Um, and that goes back to that, you know, who, when mom's out to brunch, and, oh, who's watching the kids or mom's at work, who's watching the kids? Um, dad, like, and he's not babysitting, like he's got his children. Um, and that's been a, a big conversation, especially in mom circles lately. Um, so if, if you can set that up ahead of time and, Typically what I do is a Thursday to Monday and off week Thursday nights. And what that does is it gives the children consistency to know that every Thursday night I'm with the non-custodial parent and then every other weekend. Yep, yep. Okay, you briefly mentioned it, but wow, the hot button that seems to happen is holiday. <laughs> and, it, and I've done a couple of Facebook lives with, with um, some counselors and it's, it's a disaster in a lot of families, causes all kinds of problems. Um, so any tips on how you work the holidays? I limit holidays. So the major holidays that I like to focus on are... Spring break, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and summer. That's it. Every other holiday falls where it falls. Birthdays fall where they fall. Be grown ups, figure it out. 
Um, I know a lot of the parenting plans around here really get down to Memorial Day and Labor Day and Fourth of July and Halloween. And it's, I feel like that's too much because then your concept, because your, your holiday plan supersedes and interrupts your regular parenting time. So that takes away from the consistency and the routine of the children. And we all know how important routine is for children. I agree. Yeah. This year, 2021 was funny because with a Saturday, Sunday being Christmas Eve, Christmas Day and New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. And there became issues where sometimes parents didn't see their kid for three weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that can be hard. And there's ways that you can adjust for that. But sometimes that's just going to happen especially with holidays and, and the way they fall. But understand that through the course of your child's life, that's going to happen for the other parent a couple times. It's also going to happen for you a couple times. So having a long-term vision on those sorts of things is very important instead of just going, this year wasn't fair. Like, okay, it's not fair all of the time. Um, but we do the best we can. And sometimes there are unforeseen consequences to that. And sometimes it is a break. Now you can put in a provision that says if the holiday schedule ends up being such that a parent will not see the child for three weeks, then midway point through that week, not the parent that doesn't have the children shall have the children for two or three nights. I mean, you can make something like that. It's just, it's such a rare occurrence. I rarely do that. Um, it sounds so like I, you also do rely on ongoing communication. It's required. Well, man, how much parents hate each other. They, it's something that just, it, it feels to me like it is a, a necessity that this has to happen. It is. Um, you, you do have to communicate with the other parents. Sometimes that is not easy to do and we recognize that. And so that's why there's lovely programs like Our Family Wizard, um, not a sponsor, that um, help with those sorts of communications. Um, that's why any changes in the parenting plan need to be put in writing and we can say email or text message count for that unless you're a family that needs to be on our family wizard. Um, but the need for communication and changing things diminishes greatly the more detailed your parenting plan is. Yeah. Because it takes away the confusion and it gives you rules. So yes, you should always be communicating. You should always be asking these things. But if you come to a point where you cannot agree, then you've got this parenting plan that tells you what the rules are. I like it. Real back, circling back for a second on, you said that there are, there are some programs out there that you can use. Do they incorporate like even a text or emails or is, are there ways to kind of, I guess, gather information and have it stored somewhere? Yes. So the, the one I'm most familiar with, I've mentioned a couple of times is our family wizard. I think there's another one called two houses. Um, and these programs, they're apps on your phone. Um, they have a messaging system. What I really like about this messaging system is that it is controlled by a third party. And I can, as an attorney, get access and download all of the communications. And they track when the conversation was started. So when the email chain was started, when it was seen by the other party, when it was responded to by the other party. So there's none of this, oh, I didn't see your message. No, it was opened at this time. So it, it tracks those sorts of communications and it makes it very easy to track. And it's because it's controlled by a third party, I can use it in court because I can verify better than an email. That particular program also has a calendar that you can color coordinate. So both people are on and you know who has which evenings. It helps with, I, I have families that go through at the beginning of the year and they sit down 
and they plug in what weekends are moms and what weekends are dads and what holidays. And then they can start working around some, you know, if there's any issues or any confusion, they can start doing that. And then they have a color coordinated calendar for the whole year. Then um, it also has a reimbursement aspect where if, you know, there's uncovered medical expenses or something like that, you can go through this app and request it and then market is paid once that's done. The, you were running, I always run out of time, we're running out of time, <laughs> but I really, really briefly, one thing I'd like to talk about is, is there any way you can tackle some of the cost sharing issues that arise. And I know that there's child support and, and all of that, but it seems invariably a something will come up and it's going to cost. And one parent says you pay and the other parent says, no, you pay. Yeah. So typically, as we've talked about with extracurricular activities and the custodial parent being able to pick one activity where the schedule is made by a third party, that's usually covered by child support. Um, extracurriculars are included in that. Um, any agreed upon extracurricular activities are split 50-50, but this all has to be in your agreement in this way in order for it to work this way. Um, otherwise, it's just a free for all and everybody's pointing the finger and saying, you pay, you pay. Um, but typically, you know, you're, School-related extracurricular activity is covered by child support. If there's activities that mom and dad agree on, those are split 50-50. Um, uncovered health care expenses are split 50-50. That can go down to, you know, we can go down to clothes and other school fees and that. Then you have a reimbursement clause that says reimbursements must be requested within 30 days of receiving or incurring the cost and then must be paid within 30 days of the reimbursement request. If you do not request within that 30 days, you have waived your rights to reimbursement of that cost. Again, has to be in your parenting plan. Um, and then there's also, I usually put in something that if one parent's obligation is going to be more than $250, say for like orthodontia, they can create a parenting, they can create a payment plan with the provider so long as they pay on time such that the child's treatment is not interrupted. I, I, I love that. I mean, it just makes complete sense that, you know, you don't know what the costs are gonna be, but that doesn't mean you can't sort of try to plan for them. Yeah, and kids are expensive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and again, last question then. Goals, you know, parents always set goals and it's good to set goals, uh, but that I imagine that over the years, those goals can be challenged. Um, what, do you, what do you tell a parent who says, well, you know, do I have to change my goals or should I change my goals? Am I, yeah. How does that... How does that kind of fit into the whole parenting plan thing? Well, if we're talking about parenting plans, then my first question is, why is this in the best interest of your child? Um, because if we're creating a first parenting plan, then we want to make sure that we cover you know, all of the bases and do what's in the best interest of your child. If your goals are changed or something has changed, then the court's going to look and their standard is best interest of the child. So explain to me why what you want is in the best interest of your child. Yeah. It really seems at the end of the day that this is not one of those cases where it is better to ask for forgiveness than permission. Oh, golly, no. Um, let's, you know, communicate early and often. Get a parenting plan that is very clear. Um because you never know what's going to come up. You guys are great and everybody's kumbaya and everybody's happy until mom gets a boyfriend, dad doesn't like him, and now nobody's agreeing to anything and you've got zero rules. We're in the wild, wild west. And now you have to, on top of all of this other angst, get attorneys involved. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so parenting plans save money. It, they do. They absolutely do. My goal is to touch a family once. Yeah. Unless there is some sort of emergency or somebody has had something awful happen, my goal is to touch a family once. I want your parenting plan to take you from where you are until your child is out of your home, no longer a minor, and you not have to come see me again. That is wonderful advice. Um, Sabrina, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. You give it a great look, um, you know, and you made it understandable. And that's not always easy sometimes, you know, with, with such legal issues and, you know, legal responsibilities, but you did. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. And everyone else, thank you for joining us again today. If anyone has any further questions on today's topic, you can obviously post it here. We can get you connected with Sabrina. And until next time, stay safe, stay happy, and we'll see you next time.